If we can please stand. Praise the Lord be with you. The Apostle Paul said, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so it will be for those who have died in Christ. God will raise them to be with the Lord forever. Comfort one another with these words. You may be seated. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Carl Grundling. I'm the minister here at St. Andrews uh, for the last just over six years. Um, it's uh, partly because of Mary that I'm here. She was part of the search committee, and I've shared with the family. I still remembered what she asked me on a Skype call, and I remembered the face, and I rem remembered the smile at the time. So uh, if some of you uh, have a beef, it's, it's with Mary. Um, if you've got a beef, that I'm here. It wasn't just her. She was just part of the team. But um, After... The service up here, we will go downstairs uh, for lunch. If you want to join us there and join the family there, maybe catch up. I've, I've seen a few faces walking in that are not from here, so there's probably a lot of catch up to do. So this might turn into a very long lunch, but by all means, catch up and share some stories of Mary together. But we are here um, today by our shared affection for Mary Campbell, um, a shared sorrow um, but also a shared hope in Christ. Maybe a hope that uh, she fanned for each one of us. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bless you for the great company of all those that have kept the faith. All those people that have finished their races on this earth. And who now rest from their labor. Especially today, we thank you for the life of Mary. Like she did, help us to believe where we haven't seen. Like she did, help us to trust you to lead us through our years and bring us all at last with your saints into the joy of your home. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing a song, so please join me in that. Uh, you can stand if you're able. Um, it's called In Christ Alone.
I'm going to invite Anne to uh, share some stories of mom as she delivers the eulogy for us this morning. Come on, Anne. Have you ever experienced something that just totally captures and describes someone you know? Like when you're shopping and you see that perfect outfit for your best friend. An Instagram post about an evening out entices you to try that new restaurant. Or you read a book that is just what a family member would enjoy. I read the following verses in the Bible and realized they described our mom to a T. The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 says this. We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your works of faith and labors of love and steadfastness of hope in Jesus Christ. That's our mom. So let's talk about her labors of love. Raise your hand if you've ever eaten a meal at Mary's house. (laughs) Thank you. Raise your hand if you had more than one protein source at that meal, (laughs) beef and chicken. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you arrived less than an hour before the meal and was still able to enjoy a three-course meal with dessert. (laughs) Mary's love of hospitality was just legendary, but it wasn't just meals to feed people. It was also about service. There were the times she helped me to make food for church and fundraising events that I was involved in. I would arrive home and we'd make two dozen muffins before supper. We'd have a merry meal and after supper we would make a hundred cookies because she had a recipe for how to make a hundred (laughs) cookies. The next day it would begin all over again. She would excuse herself to go to the church for an event and I would secretly be delighted because I could have a nap. Uh, But no, I was left with instructions about what to do for the next bake. Her labors of love were not just about food. They were about people. Her kids, her grandkids, an extended family of the Elstons and Irwins were her favorite labors of love. That looked like trips for ice cream, lots of moving assistance, waffles for breakfast, quilts for beds, and long conversations that were filled with wisdom and love. Mary's acts of faith permeated her whole life. My brother and I grew up spending part of our summer on beaches with a team of people who would tell Bible stories to children. We learned to be creative and engaging because if you weren't, kids would just go swimming. In epic Mary legend style, she spent part of one afternoon talking to members of a motorcycle gang that had gathered on the beach. After Mary charmingly explained the purpose of the Bible story gathering, they offered her protective services should there be any interruptions. Mm -hmm. Her acts of faith were just part of her everyday life. Mom's life was not a segmented one where faith and church stuff only happen on Sunday. Her acts of faith were seen in the people she served, the books she read, and the open door and availability to help wherever she was needed. My brother and I have learned a lot about loving and serving people by watching our mom. John and I are honored and grateful for all the love and service she received from those who loved her. In the last month with her, we've seen it everywhere, from the medical staff at the hospital to the people who regularly called and visited mom, the meaningful cards and texts we received. Her neighbors cared for her and honored her on the regular. We're grateful for the carbohydrates and cheese that have appeared at our door. (laughs) Even people who would call and say, sit down and have some tea and a good cry, come on over when you do it. John and I say thank you with overwhelmed and grateful hearts. Mom's steadfastness of hope in Jesus Christ was just ever present. She was just pragmatic. I'll just pray. Because of her hope in Jesus Christ, she could quietly walk into really hard situations and just serve other people. I think in the last few weeks of her life, her steadfastness was so evident. She had been recording her thoughts about her life. She was so delighted with her apartment and with how her steadfast hope in Jesus got her there. 
she wrote, I have two bedrooms and a garage. Lots of room. I can sit back and look out the windows and say, thank you, Jesus. So nice to have my own place. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. Our mom would tell you that her life was ordinary and unremarkable, but I disagree. Our mom lived a remarkable life. Christian author Ann Voskamp wrote this, the only way to live a truly remarkable life is not to get everyone to notice you, but to leave noticeable marks of his love everywhere you go. Mary's labors of love, works of faith, and her steadfast hope in Jesus Christ have left noticeable marks on us all. And we are just so grateful. Thank you, Anne. It's beautiful. Um, I might need to take some time out and just delete some of my notes for my message. <laughs> I'm going to ask you again if you've been fed by Mary. <laughs> But is that true? It, it needs to be repeated. That's what I'm going to stick with. Thank you very much. And we, we're going to read two passages from Scripture, and then uh, I'll give a, a short message from that. Um, but I'm going to invite uh, um, John up to, to come and read those passages for us. It's passages that they chose from uh, Psalm 16 and 1 Corinthians. So please join. From Psalm 16, Lord, you've assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made, my, made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, your eternal pleasures at your right hand. And from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 13. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we now know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is, what, what is unseen is eternal. Thank you. I'm so glad that uh, he offered to read the scriptures, because that passage from 2 Corinthians is part of the formulary that we have in our book of forms that we use at um, the grave sites normally. And I've got the hardest time to say that word, momentary troubles. I can do it now because that's the only word, but in there, the second language doesn't do the trick for me there. So th thank you very much. Before I, I I'm going to start with my message. Um, they need to just be a few ground rules before I get into it. Mary used to sit right about there pretty much every Sunday. If she wasn't in church, she wasn't in town, or she was sick. Otherwise, she, she was always there. And uh, she would nod at all the right places and <laughs> smile at all the right places. So, just some ground rules for today, if you sit in this general area, <laughs> at the right places, nod and smile at the right places. D don't confuse them, please, otherwise uh, I might be off my game. That was Mary for you. That was, that's where she was every Sunday. Now, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians is, for a big part, a defense of 
his ministry over and against some of the false apostles that were making the rounds in the area of, of Corinth. Um, there were these people who tried to discredit Paul's ministry. And, and even this new faith that he proclaimed and that led to the birth of these new churches, the one Corinth included. And, and one of the accusations that these false prophets made against Paul and his companions was that they couldn't possibly be genuine servants of God. Because to all appearances, God had abandoned them. Well, to be fair, to all appearances, they did have a point. Um, because Paul and his companions faced hardships everywhere they went. A bit later in 2 Corinthians, Paul lists the afflictions he, he faced. Uh, he had been stoned. He had been imprisoned. He has been shipwrecked three times. Uh, he experienced hunger, thirst, cold, nakedness. He faced death a few times. Jeepers, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, a few verses later on where, where we stopped, he says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, which was the amount of lashes that would, upon agreed customs, would be enough to beat somebody to death, the 40. And in Jewish law and Deuteronomy, it said that no Jew should be beaten more than 40 times because then it becomes beastly. So if you would lose count or miscount, you might get to 40 or just over 40, and that would be against the law. You would turn another human being into beast. You might kill them. So let's keep to 39. It's, it's a safe space. Paul says five times. They nearly beat me to death. So false apostles might have a point. I mean, it didn't really look like this gospel was the next best thing. If you just looked at appearances, they, they were spot on. It might have looked like Paul was abandoned by God. To them, and, and maybe everybody else, it, it seemed as if God was against and not with Paul. Now, now, at the same time, the Christians in Corinth were being tempted to turn away from the gospel Paul had, had preached to them, a gospel of bearing your cross, and turn towards a gospel that promised health and wealth and success right here and now. So this is the context of Paul's writing to the good folks in Corinth. In defense of this gospel and in defense of his ministry and his life following Jesus. So he writes to them and he says, It's written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With the same spirit of faith we also believe and therefore also speak. Why would anyone follow and preach Jesus when it often leads to hardship and suffering? You see, Paul didn't preach Christ because it made life easy and enjoyable. He preached Christ because he believed in God's promises. God's love and mercy are not found by sight. It's not found in our outward circumstances, but it's found by faith in His promises. And, and Paul was a living testimony to this. And so was Mary. If somebody walks into our worship services on a, on a regular Sunday morning and look around, guess what they will see? Fantastically wealthy, healthy, successful people with no trouble whatsoever. I don't know what church you go to, but that, that's this one. Of course not. They would see people who knows what it is to suffer through poor health, financial struggles, family conflict, emotional trials. So some may even question what, what we're doing here, since following Jesus doesn't seem to offer many earthly, tangible benefits. They will be right in some ways. The primary promise of the gospel is not to give us earthly benefits now. Although, although we can all testify that God has blessed us far beyond anything we deserve. 
But the certainty of forgiveness and peace with God now already on earth and life with Him then forever, that's the big thing. Peace with God this side of heaven. And then time with Him forevermore in the fullness of His glory. That's the promise. And as we grasp that, as we believe that promise from, from God, then life here and now changes. If everything is not just about life here on earth, if, if this isn't it, if, if there is more, then I can take the challenges and the joys from the year now. Because now I've got perspective. C can I use an example? I indulge me. We came from South Africa six, seven years ago. And we tried to visit over Christmas every two years. We became citizens only a couple of years ago. So before that, we needed visas for every country in Europe. Um, we needed a visa to go to the, to the U.S. Guess what? They cost money. Okay. So, um, as we went to South Africa, we had these layovers. Because the cheapest flights are always the one with the longest layovers. And if, if you want to deal with on airfare, you are going to have a long layover. And, and you're going to be stuck in the airport. So our longest layover going to South Africa was 11 hours. And a lot of people go, Ooh. And there's, there's not much to do, necessarily. So imagine yourself being stuck in an airport for 11 hours. You cannot get out. Like, you literally cannot get out. You can, but it's going to be some problems. <laughs> Horrible holiday. Horrible holiday. The worst you can get. If that was your whole holiday. That wasn't it for us. The holiday, the thing we were striving for was time with family. At the beach house and on the safari farm. So at the airport, that wasn't our holiday. So knowing that, we actually made plans to enjoy it for what it was. And did we ever have a good time? We, we, we didn't spend any minute in a lounge. You think, we, oh yeah, you were in the lounge. No, we weren't. It cost money. We were having the best time. We had snacks packed, the things that were allowed to go through customs. We had board games. We had cards. We had the best times ever when we were forced to stay inside for those long layers. Now we go out. Now it's fun outside. Because we can. So we take the kids out and show them places and we try to hit a different spot every time on a layover. But for the first two trips, we had fun. Even on an 11-hour layover inside an airport. Because that wasn't our holiday. We had something else that we were looking forward to. So while we are here, waiting for that, we're going to have the best time we can here. So it seems like Mary, Paul, and Corinthians, and David in, in, in Psalms had a point. They had something else inside their hearts that they, that they treasured. Promises from God. So all of this on earth, everything that was going on that affected them here, this wasn't it. Ever. For any of the three of them. They knew there was something else. For them, there were more. And because of this perspective that there was more to come, they could enjoy all of this in the meantime. They could have joy here in the meantime. Because this wasn't it. it, it it's a weird thing. It, it's a weird thing watching somebody live that is really committed to Jesus. Things sometimes may look horrible for outsiders. 
And then they go, oh, praise God. Or God is so faithful. Like, what do I not see? What's up with that? It, it's a weird thing. Now, I'm sure Mary has had her fair share of burdens to bear. Probably the biggest one was Bob's passing. I, I don't know. It was before he came. But that was probably the biggest thing. And, and she would have had many more. But I've never seen her not smiling sometime during a conversation. Always. She had this strange seriousness versus joy thing going on. She could have the most serious conversation with you. And she'll have that same smile. Never once have I had a conversation with Mary where she didn't smile during that conversation. And I don't think I've heard her complain. I, I, I don't think I've heard her complain ever. But it, it's, it's hard to describe. She, she was always smiling, but seemed to be serious about life and Jesus. At the same time, it's this weird thing, but this beautiful thing. I always got this idea that Mary was on a long layover. This wasn't her final destination. But man, did she, make, did she make the best of the time during this layover. She served everyone that crossed her path so well. I'm not, I'm not sure um, if there's anyone here that, that hasn't either received a meal from Mary or who wasn't treated to a lunch or dinner at her home. Like, I couldn't see all the hands, but I, it, I just saw the sides and some ants because I was sitting behind Anne, but I guess all the hands went up. Our little Emma, she's four years old now, she calls her the lady that brings us food. <laughs> and we, we've had quite a few people that will bring us a meal or some treats for the kids every now and then. So I don't know why that's her connection with Mary. Mary was one of the ladies that took her turn for uh, child care on Sundays. Th that's her connection. I, I don't know why. But, but she was selfless. She was always serving. 83 years of age, when we moved into a new house and started re renovations, what can an 83-year-old lady do in house renovations? You want to know? <laughs> they can peel the wallpaper. So that's what she, she came with. She had a little step stool. She brought it. Can I peel some wallpaper? She came a few times. One secret that I never shared with Mary was, because there was no stopping, hey? Once she starts... She, she goes until she really she cannot, like she's done. And then she's, she's okay, that's it for today. That, that was the word. But you've done all of this now. One secret I never shared with Mary was uh, that she just kept going the, the last time she was there. She started peeling the wallpaper on a wall that I took out. <laughs> I, I just couldn't get myself... To tell her that after. Mary was just being the servant that she was. And once we, we saw that, oops, Mary's on that wall now. And, and she was quite a far away into it. Like, she was close to done for the day. But yeah. But that, that's who Mary was. She's looking for ways to serve everybody. Serve everybody. We could all see that the Lord alone was her portion and her cup. He sure made her, her lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for her in pleasant places. And surely she has a delightful inheritance. And she left a delightful legacy in turn. So until we meet her again, May the Lord be our portion and our cup. And may each of you here today know that we can all have that same delightful inheritance. That's the invitation for everybody.
Man, if you've shared any conversation with Mary, you know that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we've reflected on your scriptures and on Mary's life, the memories pop up of the many ways how she has touched our lives. Each one of us in different ways, probably all of them with a plate of food at some stage. But because her life touched ours, she is missed now. And then you are fully aware of the sorrows that each person carries with them today. The sorrows that come with losing a mom, losing a close, close friend, losing a grandma, somebody like a grandma. So my prayer is that you will touch all of these hearts and minds today with your compassion and that gentle care that you have. So that we may also know your everlasting love in the same way that that Mary did. Bless every memory that we have of Mary. Bless every tear that is shed as we miss her. But bless us all with the same sense of open peace that she tried to show us her whole life. So bless us and make your loving presence known to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to sing another song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And uh, it might have been a song that Mary could have penned. So uh, please join me in singing this. now from this place with the blessing of our compassionate God. The Lord will bless you and keep you. 
The Lord will make His face shine upon you and He will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift His face toward you and He will give you His peace. Amen. Folks, as we make our way out with the family, you can remain standing for us. And then when we are out, you can uh, make your way downstairs for lunch.